a moment, we'll be sniffing a few cows in California, helping Billy grow his hair with stinging nettles, finding out how Nelson's Wee Wee got into Toby's wine, and making a mechanical bird or two in deepest Florida. But first, have you ever wondered why Asian women have small breasts? Chinatown in London. The experimental team is getting to grips with a sticky problem. That's right, the earwax of Southeast Asia. This one. That one. It's like that. See that one. That one? Half, half. Half and half? Really? Yes, there's a difference between European earwax and that found in much of Asia. And the world expert on the subject is this man. Dr. Koshiri Yoshoro from the University of Nagasaki. His work with earwax is helping us to understand how early humans conquered the world. Earwax and global domination. Uh, there are two types of earwax in the human being. One is a uh, dry type like this, a powder-like substance that is frequently seen among East Asians. And uh, the other one is a uh, wet, wet type, sticky, like this, yeah? Uh, this is uh, common among uh, Caucasians and Black Africans. Yeah, such exists. <laughs> Intrigued by this geographical phenomenon, Dr. Yoshiro asked colleagues around the world to collect nail clippings and blood samples from just about every ethnic group on the planet. They analysed the DNA from each sample, fed it into a computer, and looked to find out if there was a genetic difference between people with dry earwax and people with wet wax. We found that a single gene determines the visible human genetic trait. That is earwax. Yeah, that is surprising, I think. Yeah. But the amazing thing was the distribution of this gene. It supported a controversial theory on how humans first conquered the Earth. Well, the human being originated in Africa. They started to move uh, from Africa to all of the world. That was uh, 100,000 years ago. Somewhere along the line, the dry earwax gene became dominant amongst humans living in China, Japan, and much of Southeast Asia. Then, around 85,000 years ago, something happened which made some of these people cross to North America. The first of the waves of immigration that brought the dry earwax gene at least as far south as Bolivia. Our experiments showed that the, the Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, the Native Americans and some Bolivians have a common ancestor. They were living around Lake Baikal 20,000 years ago. Rather surprisingly, the dry earwax gene is responsible for some other rather personal traits. Do you use deodorant? No. You don't use deodorant? No. Uh, no. You don't? No. Yep. You've guessed it. Okay. In the same way as the gene blocks the production of earwax, it also blocks the production of stinky sweat. This might explain why deodorants don't sell too well in Japan. Okay, fine. I smelled your under here. Ah, uh, no. Okay. Oh, but Dr. Yashiro believes that his earwax gene has something even more surprising up its sleeve. I believe that uh, Asian women have a smaller breast size than other. Uh, women, uh, for example, Caucasians and black people. So the, uh, the size of the breast uh, tissue, uh, I believe that uh, this is uh, related to uh, dry earwax. But how to prove Dr. Yoshiro's theory? Could I um, touch your... Uh... Not even just a little bit? <laughs> oh, go on, it's, uh, I'll pretend. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. Definitely not? No. <laughs> Still to come on Experimental, how to turn instant boy bands into instant fighter pilots. And how these birds might help them get better planes to fly in. But first, let's see just how stupid Billy Bunter is prepared to be in the name of science. Every now and again in the life of a scientist, young and not so young, 
one comes across the work of a colleague that will literally change your life. And this is that moment for Billy Bunter. You see, he's just come across US patent number 6596266, a potion to cure male pattern baldness using nettles. It's just what Billy needs. Perhaps that highly strung demonstrator Karina will fall for him with a full head of hair. True to the test department's ethos, why buy it when you can make it, Billy hightails it off to the garden in search of the ingredients. And soon, he's boiling it all up and dreaming of a new quiff. But what is male pattern balding? Well, it seems to be a genetic characteristic, and it's caused by the hormone that makes men big and hairy in the first place, testosterone. There are enzymes in the body which change testosterone into another hormone, dihydrotestosterone. And it's this hormone that leads to the hair follicles shrinking and ultimately falling out. There's a chemical in nettles that's part of this potion which claims to prevent the change from testosterone to dihydrotestosterone and perhaps result in a healthy head of hair. So let's see if it works. Ah, well, Billy, if you'd bothered to read the whole patent, you'd have noticed that the required chemical is found mainly in the roots, not the leaves, and is only part of the brew. Coming up later on Experimental, the planet-killing cows of California and the aeroplane that thinks it's a bird. But first, a tactile vest from Holland. At Experimental, we heard that a Dutch company, TNO, were working on a new system that could help both boy bands and jet fighters strut their stuff. So we headed to Susterberg in Utrecht as fast as we could. When we looked through the door, it blew our minds. These three boys only met 20 minutes ago, and already they've got a dance routine worthy of the Eurovision Song Contest. This impressive feat was all down to their attire. This little number, the tactile vest, brainchild of Jan van Erp, with this man. Hendrik Jan van Veen. The tactile vest is a display for your skin, very similar to the way a monitor or a uh, set of headphones is a display for your eyes or for your ears. Experimental has come across one or two things like this in the past, a hugging shirt of Rome or the Singapore chicken vest. But this seems to be taking the idea to a different level. These guys are being controlled by a computer, switching on and off more than a hundred of these little vibrators. All you have to do is react and you can dance. Well, sort of. Luckily, inflicting the world with pre-programmed boy bands is not the only use for this tactile vest. Thanks, boys. Jan hopes that his electronics will soon be found in one of these. A fighter pilot is a very busy pilot. He has to uh, pay attention to many different systems and has to perform many tasks at the same time. Uh, obviously, he has to fly the aircraft uh, when it's not on autopilot. Uh, but he also has to deal with lots of different types of information. And it means that his eyes are really occupied by reading displays, looking outside, and doing different things. By bringing touch into the equation with the tactile vest, Jan hopes to bring another sense to the fighter pilot's weapons. If their eyes or ears miss some vital information, like an incoming missile, a vibrating widget should alert them to the danger. The principle we're using is the same principle as the one that you're used to, which is a tap on the shoulder. Somebody taps you on the shoulder, you know which way to look. Well done, Biggles. But what's this chap doing in the shorts? Well, it's just another of Jan's uses for his tickly little vest. By hooking up his vibrators to a GPS system, 
he's managed to create a navigation device for cross-country runners. No more losing your rhythm checking the map, just keep jogging until a little tickle sends you to the right or left. But whilst controlling butch men with vibrators might get some people excited, it seems that Experimental finds tickling boy bands the most fun. Don't try this at home! Ah! In a moment, we'll be trying to lift a test department tester with a glass of water, going bird watching in Florida, and sniffing cow whiff in California. But first, let's head to the test department to take mathematics a little too far. Down at the test department, Toby is getting all morbid. It's the birthday of his greatest hero, the British Admiral Lord Nelson, who died over 200 years ago. Hello. Bonjour. Still, he's trying to convince Horace that it remains possible to be at one with a great man. Toby's argument is based on the following facts. Every time Nelson breathed out, approximately 2.4 times 10 to the 22, yes, 22 noughts, molecules of gas came out of his mouth. And the fact that there are about 1.04 times 10 to the 44 molecules of gas in the Earth's atmosphere, Toby has worked out that this will mean that approximately 5.4 molecules of the gases that were once in Nelson's last breath will be in each breath of his. Whilst he's feeling a bit chuffed with himself, Horace is doing some calculations of his own. Given the fact that there are about 5.7 times 10 to the 46 water molecules on Earth, and that Nelson would have drunk about 52,000 litres of the stuff in his life, there's a good chance that Toby's glass of wine will contain an awful lot of the atoms that were once part of Nelson's urine. On its way, the ultimate boy's toy, the plane that thinks it's a bird. And fun things to do with a hot water bottle. But first, what's choking the planet? This might seem a green and pleasant land, but it's not. Look up to the hills and you'll see they're all clouded in the asthmatic's favourite, smog. A nasty mix of gases made up of what scientists like to call volatile organic compounds. Welcome to the most polluted valley in California, San Joaquin. And what's causing all that yellow muck? Well, there are the common suspects, heavy industry plus six-lane highways choked with SUVs, but there are some who claim there's another villain. It's Daisy the cow, and over three million of her ruminating friends who also live in the valley. That's right, 3.2 million cows means 3.2 million bums doing this. According to some, each of the cows manages to push out as much polluting gases as... What, one car? Two, perhaps? Well, no. The annual figure bandied about for the output of Daisy's gastric tract is said to be the equivalent of the output of no less than 85 cars. And it's not really her fault. Like any mammal, the amount of wind she produces is influenced in part by her diet. And unfortunately for her, she mainly eats grass, which is one of the hardest foods to digest. So hard that if we saw Daisy in half, we'll find a stomach with four parts, each filled with billions of bacteria, which ferment all that green stuff until they've managed to turn it into something that Daisy can actually digest. And it's all that fermentation that produces the nasty gases that pass from Daisy's front end to her rear end. So far, so repellent. But can we really blame cows for producing all that nasty yellow haze? Well, that's what this man, Frank Mittelau, from the University of California, Davis, wanted to find out. The figure for Daisy's polluting habits comes from a study done way back in 1938. At the time, they thought the smog was largely produced by methane. And since cows produce a lot of methane, the blame was laid on them. But now we know that smog is made up of a cocktail of volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. And they're found in everything from exhaust fumes to paint or underarm deodorants. 
And yes, they are found in the stuff that flies out of the back of Daisy. So what we are doing is we are trying to measure these hundreds of different VOC, volatile organic compounds, that form smog. Welcome to the world's largest fart chamber, the UC Davis Biobubbles. The bovine equivalent of that old jam jar in the bath trick. If you don't understand that, ladies, just ask your boyfriends about it. We use the biobubbles uh, to house animals to measure air quality impacts. We have one air inlet on the one side and an air outlet on the other side. And the difference between outlet and inlet is uh, what the animals and their waste and the animal feed uh, produces by means of air emissions. So what we're finding uh, is that in general, our total emission numbers are uh, much lower uh, those that are currently on the books. How much lower? Well, Dr. Mittelauer's provisional results indicate that in one year, one cow does not produce the same amount of VOCs as 85 cars. No, it's closer to 10 cars, which is still a lot. But hey, if you want cheese, milk and yoghurt, you're going to need cows. So, if you're concerned about the smog, why don't you carpool, take the bus, or better still, walk? But whatever you do, lay off the beans yourself. Still to come on Experimental, the morphing spy planes of California. But first, to the test department. Water is such fun. Often at test department towers, the team will frolic in it, play with it, and make drinks with it. Sometimes, they'll even cook up new and innovative uses for it, like using it to lift a person. How can this happen? Well, as you can see, water on its own is not very good at lifting anything. In fact, it's rather good at allowing things to sink through it. But if we were to put it into this fancy water bladder 3000 machine, and all of a sudden, water's lifting properties are revealed. To get the pressure up, all we have to do is pour the water into this pipe at a great height. There. So why did she rise? Well, it's all to do with the weight of a column of water. Imagine our little tube went all the way to the bottom of the deepest ocean. As our submarine drops into the depths, the pressure of the water increases the deeper it goes. By the time it gets to the bottom, at 10,660 metres, the pressure is a staggering 1,068 kilograms per square centimetre, enough to crush all but the toughest of subs. Even with the pressure of a three-metre column of water pressing down on it, the pressure in our hot water bottle rises to 0.3 kilograms per square centimetre. Not only enough to lift a person, but also to blow holes in it. Meet Dr Rick Lind and his team. Big boys with a little dream. The morphing spy plane. They want to make a plane so manoeuvrable that it can fly over a city and ultimately swoop down and into a room. The real application for aircraft is in urban operations or flying within a city. We can imagine if someone released a dangerous gas in downtown Los Angeles, we could have a small aircraft that could fly throughout the city into parking garages, between alleys, inside of buildings even, to look for this dangerous substance. The plane needs to be not just small, it needs to be bird-like, too. Our real objective is to build airplanes that actually can do what birds do. They can fly where birds fly and do maneuvers like birds can maneuver. Aeronautical engineers have always been inspired by birds, but until now, most wings have been rigid and fixed, like this. But Dr. Lin's wings are flexible, and for good reason. We have large airplanes that fly above the cities and high in the sky, but we need airplanes that can operate at treetop level or even car level. And that's where all this flexibility comes in. It's about making the wing adapt to different situations. In both birds and planes, the shape of the wing determines what the beast can do. Long, thin wings are great for distance flying, but pretty useless when it comes to dodging around in small places. 
For that, you need short wings, but they're only good for short flights. To make the ultimate flying machine, you need a wing that can change to suit the conditions, long and thin to get you there, and short and stubby to whisk you around. The king of the wing change is the seagull. One of the first things we looked at was what shapes did the seagull change into during its flight. How does a seagull change its shoulders, elbows, its muscles, and its feathers when it wants to land versus taking off? How does a seagull change its shape to fly into a strong wind? To find out exactly how they did it, Dr. Lin sent out a spy of his own who took thousands of pictures of birds in all aspects of flight. The photographs that we're looking for are gliding pictures of birds. So you'll see that as the birds attempt different maneuvers, they'll change the shape of their wings to change the aerodynamics. And this is of particular interest to us because then we can mimic these shapes using mechanical actuators on our morphing airplanes and try to accomplish the same type of gliding capability. Once they knew the wing shapes they wanted to mimic, the hard part really began. Well, as you can see, we've installed motors and electronics on the airplane that will physically cause the wing to bend and rotate about the shoulder and elbow, just like a seagull would change its wing in flight. But the real key to getting a wing to flex like a seagull's wasn't so much the actuators. Our wing design differs from conventional airplanes mostly because it's a very, very thin wing. Because I have that thin wing, our wings can bend and twist in ways a large aircraft could not. OK, but can it actually fly? Pretty impressive. In fact, the boys are so confident that they've cracked bird flight that they're beginning to get a bit more relaxed about the type of birds they're observing down at the beach. <coughs> and finally on Experimental, a cooking lesson from the test department. Toby here is keen to find out if eating asparagus can make your urine smell of the green-fingered vegetable within 15 minutes. So let's see if it's true. Well, now we've got a sample that, yes, seems to smell of asparagus, let's test it out on a random selection of the great British public. Sadly, the first two seem only to smell that standard urinal whiff. But the third, who does seem to be a bit of a plant, is convinced of the aroma. As asparagus? Asparagus. I mean very interesting. Interestingly, Horace has been in the test department library digging out a few papers on the subject. You see, in 1952, scientists shoved asparagus-tinged wee under the noses of 115 people in the UK and found that only 40% could smell the whiff. Oh. The ability seemed to run in families. If you can smell it, it's quite possible, therefore, that your dad and granddad can too, which suggests that genetics might be involved. Even stranger, studies have shown that Israelis and Chinese people are far less likely to be able to smell asparagus in the wee wee, even when it's definitely there, than Europeans are. However, despite over a century of studies, no one seems to be sure exactly what it is in the asparagus that makes the whiff. <laughs> 